Stop. Welcome to The Perfect Song. I'm Matt, and I want to welcome our panelists, Mike. Hello. And Alan. Hello. And we will be discussing the song, Where Is My Mind by Pixies. This song is very, very influential pop in popular culture. It shows up in movies. It's covered by a lot of artists. Uh, this song was number 493 on mm-hmm. Rolling Stone's 500 Greatest Songs of All Time. Just got in there. 493 of the top 500. Um if and it had been eight worse, it wouldn't be on there. It wouldn't be on there. You, it would be lost to time. This song uh, came out in 88 from the album Surfer Rosa. Black Francis wrote this song about his experiences scuba diving in the Caribbean. And um, yeah, it's uh, lyrically kind of a silly song about little fish chasing him around. But uh, uh, when was the first time uh, this song came into your consciousness I, I i was late to the pixies game um i know the first time i heard it <laughs> in a movie in a movie wasn't no it was in college oh, oh okay um the, that's the first time i heard it um it resonated with me at the time but not as much as it did later on with the movie <laughs> which is fight club um it's like the, the perfect song for movies i don't know why yeah and it was during that closing scene of the movie where they had it going. Um, and that's when it really resonated with me as like what kind of feelings it captured and all that stuff. But I did first hear it in college. And again, I liked it. I just, it didn't resonate the same way, sure. even though it should have, because during my college years, I should have been a lot more what the song is confused and questioning things. And where's my mind. And that was more of my college days than, mm-hmm. than it was in the, uh, what fight club was like nine, late nineties sometime. Marla, look at me. I'm really okay. Trust me. Everything's gonna be fine. You met me at a very strange time in my life. The film itself evokes a very strong visual has a strong visual sense to it. And also, I mean, obviously, <laughs> during the, that the time when Fight Club came out, I mean, that's when the whole Y2K thing was going, it was like big in all of our lives. They're talking about it. And there's mm-hmm. like the turn of the millennium. And there's a, there was a lot of disarray and chaos during that time too. Not, not like there isn't now, but <laughs> um, but it is one of those things where I, it, it just evoked more at that time period than it did for me when I first heard it. Sure. How about you, Al? Uh, yeah, I heard it first in college, uh, roughly, when it came out, maybe a little later. Um, I wouldn't say I was late to the Pixies game, because that's not a thing I would <laughs> say. But uh, I don't think I heard it right when it came out. Uh, it is uh, for, it's from a great record, and it is a, a great song. And... I always love one of the things I like about the Pixies is there's very often this kind of contrast between it's kind of like driving rocking sound and Frank Black or Black Francis, however you want to say it, his vocals are very brittle and kind of high pitched. So there's an interesting juxtaposition there for me, Hmm. which I like about, you know, most Pixie songs. Um, I I feel my feeling about the Pixies or Pixies. I don't know if I'm supposed to say the Pixies. I think it's just Pixies. I think it's just Pixies. My feeling about Pixies. See, then then it it sounds like I'm talking about fairies and like, (laughs) oh, dryads and little nymphs. So I'm going to say the Pixies and they can sue me. Sure. Uh, My feeling about the Pixies is that their songs are on a continuum between where is my mind and here comes my man. <laughs> and so uh, to me, it is very uh, emblematic of their sound.
I probably heard Here Comes Your Man or Monkey Gone to Heaven first, possibly. And then I listened to the previous mm-hmm. album uh, or, you know, songs from the previous. And that's when I heard, you know, some other stuff, including this one. So, yeah, sometime early on, I heard it. The The latest example of me hearing it was just the other day. It was in a it was in an EarPods Pro commercial. OK, I'm like, oh, there's this song again. <laughs> not a sponsor <laughs> not a sponsor apple you can sponsor this podcast apple if you'd like if you dare oh, i challenge you <laughs> um but yeah it's used it's used in a lot of places and and then the reason is i think what mike was touching on was like it kind of really evokes a dislocation of or or a being in your mind and being sort of bewildered perhaps by what's around you somehow and uh and i think that goes to the elements of the song i think the um you know the little quiet sort of quietish acoustic guitar and then kim deal's sort of famous haunting vocal little howl Mm -hmm. that kind of is in there the whole time It gives this just feeling of of dislocation or something, you know? And the guitar, the guitar line, what's his name? Santiago? Joey Santiago. Joey Santiago's guitar is great in it. I think he wrote the guitar line. It's just perfect and goes so well. And again, like you mentioned, the vocals by Black Francis. What I like so much also is that the instrumentation um, is a lot of it's very unexpected. The drums are don't have your typical progression the way you could expect them to go, and it just they they do a lot of really unexpected things in the song that you don't hear normally in a song of that's this popular. Mm. And they, they and I mean obviously you know they were one of the really big indie darling bands um, of the of that era, um, and so it is something that they created a lot of iconic uh, sounds and introduced a lot to this kind of music. You could argue that their sound and, you know, they've, they've been named as um, influences by Nirvana and so many other bands. Yeah. And um, a lot of times they're mentioned as the quote inventors of the quiet loud kind of songwriting where it's, you know, just like steps up and then, you know, gets goes back and forth in these dynamics um, so they, they were incredibly influential for nineties rock, nineties music. Um, and I think the production from a production aspect, I like the way it begins and ends it. It begins with, um, Kim Deal doing a version of the vocal and, uh, Black Francis saying stop. And I think I did a little research on it that he was actually a little annoyed that, um, Kim was getting some recognition for vocals and being more featured in songs, maybe even live. And I feel like just listening to that little beginning part is really says something, or I mean, I'm probably reading into it a little bit, but he sounds like he's annoyed that I don't want to keep hearing you. He's like, stop. (laughs) And then at the, but, but, but at the end of the song, what do we get the, just at the end of the song, we get her alone doing the vocal thing. She won. (laughs) <laughs> and I, I think that I think that makes the song in a lot of ways. I mean, that and the guitar line, or the whole thing, obviously. But that that vocal part is a huge part of the song for me. That what makes it really great. I would agree with that. Yeah, I I, I think um, that the two of them uh, having conflict in their vocals in the song also adds to the the song itself because of the. I I, I really think the song deals with a lot of inner chaos. Mm. Uh, inner uh, t- the battle of two different things and and that's why I thought it was perfect for the ending the fight club too because you're battling not to give too much away of what the fight club happens I haven't seen club. it yeah not not to give too really? much away it just no I haven't it, seen it it, it, it is something that it, it, it makes a lot of sense with that movie once you've seen it yeah um, no, it, it's it's perfect for you know it's the lazy filmmakers crutch use pixies where is my mind <laughs> 
Any Damn. lazy filmmakers out there, take a <laughs> word of advice. Like, this scene's just not working. Where's my mind? And it might be why, because of that time period in the late 90s and coming up on the turn of the millennium and all that stuff going on, why it resonated more with me at, at that time than it did when I first heard it. It kind of stands out for me as like the whole world was in, in a weird state in the late 90s. Yeah. <laughs> It, there's a lot of conflict within the song, even though it's very harmonious and melodic too. It's it's mm-hmm. it's it's really interesting how they do that. Yeah, yeah. Do you guys offhand know any any covers? What artists have covered them? Mm. I know there was a pretty recent one, and I it's slipping my mind. I I didn't write it down. Uh, telepathic teddy bear has done it. <laughs> Rockabye <laughs> baby, not a surf. Uh, not a surf. Okay, I've heard of the Bari riot. I'm trying to see what's a. Recent... I probably have the not a surf one because they have a, they they released a the, cover CD. The um one in the commercial that I saw the Apple commercial was a different artist doing it, but I think it was a released song. In other words, it was you know an already uh, existing song by an artist. And there's at least another seven that I haven't listed yet. Yeah, well, there's a lot. <laughs> can you can you list them all? I can. Maxent Siren, placebo. Jade Williams, Placebo. Emily Browning, Toadies, James Blunt, James Mike Blunt. Geyer. There you go. The app, the Apple commercial is Take Maidza. Oh yes. Okay. Take Maidza. With your feet on the air and your head on the ground. Try this trick and spin it. Yeah. yeah. Where's my mind? Where's my mind? Where is my mind? That speaks to the song that it is so useful. It's very utilitarian, <laughs> provoking. <laughs> we hope you're enjoying this Gen Explainers podcast. Remember to find us and follow us on social media. Give us a like, a follow, or support us on Patreon. And we'd much appreciate a five star rating on the podcast platform of your choice. Now, let's get back to the show. Well, let's let's ask the question, is this a perfect song? Alan, let's start with you. Okay. Uh, I will say that it is, for me, the perfect Pixies song and the perfect college rock song, if that even is still a, a concept. It was back in my uh, my day. Hmm. Um, perfect song. I, that's as far as I'm willing to go. Sure. Okay. Mike, what do you think? I actually would agree with what Alan just said. Um, it is. It, it it was an anthem for the college age group. It was it's also an anthem for the underground music scene. There's a lot of there's a lot of elements to it, and I think it is the perfect pixie song. Um, but if you were to talk about it in a the grand scheme, I, I that's yeah I, I can't either go that far. Sure, you know I agree with both of you. I think uh, you know if you sort of qualify it with like okay as a pixie song or as a a template and an example of where music was or was going to be after its release. Yes. It's the perfect song to show that. And, and, and it feels that way. And it's a perfect song to set a certain mood, um, whether it's in a film or, or what. Um, so yeah, I'm in agreement. You know what? We're in agreement on this. Uh, it's a great song. I love this. About song. damn time. Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Finally. <laughs> All right. Well, there you go. Uh, if you haven't heard the song, what? Huh? But uh, yeah, go check it out. Where is my mind? Where my mind is, is on uh, uh, what you think. So if you can comment, let us know what you think. Is this the best? Is this a perfect song? Is this the perfect Pixie song? Maybe you like uh, something else. Maybe you like uh, Nimrod's son or something. Let us know. And uh, I want to thank the panel. Thanks, guys. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye. And we'll see ya. Bye. Thank you for listening to this Gen Explainers podcast. Follow us on Instagram 
and friend us on Facebook. Just search for Gen Explainers and find us on Patreon, where you can support the channel and gain access to extended cuts of the podcast as well as exclusive bonus content. See you next time.